join our event today. First of all, I want to thank our speakers today for organizing this panel together. Um, this event is sponsored by Taiwan Tongzhi LGBTQ, LGBTQ Hotline Association and uh, the Office for Gender Equality of Taipei City Government. I'm the moderator of today's event. Um, before this event starts, I want to explain why we focus on this topic. Uh, as we know, LGBT activism usually starts from civil society, but there's, uh, there are some LGBT people working at governments. They have made some inferences on public policy in their ways. LGBT community could stand not just in the opposition to governments. In fact, some of them fight for the rights for LGBT community in a way of cooperation with the public sector instead. This is a huge challenge for both LGBT advocates and the government to collaborate with each other on policy making and uh, to um, take sexual minority into consideration. As for the LGBT community, most of European countries have proven the value. LGBT rights are human rights, but it is hard to debate in most of the Asian countries. Um, so this panel is to discuss how LGBT government staffs uh, make policy design more LGBT inclusive and how LGBT activists work with governments. What kinds of challenges obstacles and the strategies they have. Before I introduce each speaker, I'm very sorry to inform the audience that um, two of our speakers cannot attend this panel because of some emergency situation. Um, Julian from Hanover uh, is sick and uh, Lee from Korea has something emergent to take care. So today, I'm still very pleased that we have three speakers from Taiwan and Denmark. First, I'm going to introduce Oliver Fan. Uh, Fan, Miss Fan, could you wave your hand? Yes. Oliver is from Taiwan. Uh, Oliver is working as a researcher at the Office for Gender Equality of Taipei City Government. He has devoted himself to uh, HIV AIDS issues for over 15 years. He was a social worker before, um, serving at non-governmental organizations and uh, government agencies as well. Uh, what, it, what, did, uh, what he did was to assist people with living with HIV AIDS uh, for their daily lives and to fight for their human rights. And next one is Sean. Hello, Sean. Um, Sean is the director in the department of policy promoting at Tongzhi LGBT Hotline Association in Taiwan. And he has devoted his uh, to human rights issue on LGBT and HIV AIDS for almost 20 years. Um, Same-sex marriage that was passed in Taiwan in uh, 2019. However, the process of enactment was under much pressure. Sean is one of the leaders who for uh, fight for LGBT rights um, and responsible for lobbying the government and uh, talking to the public to eliminate stigma on LGBTQ community and the people living with HIV. And last one is Aaron Lefebvre from Denmark. Hello, Aaron. Um, Aaron is a passionate and multilingual champion of human rights with uh, experience in international politics and the global LGBTI plus and the pride community. He is leading the Copenhagen 2021 Human Rights Forum with the goal to ele elevate the international LGBTI plus agenda, working together with a multitude of governments civil society and uh, non-governmental organizations, both in Denmark and abroad. So the next, I will um, explain the time and the rules and the order of the presentation. 
Um, the order would be uh, first one is Oliver Fan, and then Sean, and last one is Aaron. Each speaker has 15 to 20 minutes for presentation. The audience is welcome to post your questions on the method board. Our speakers will try to answer these questions in the Q&A session. So now let's welcome our first speaker, Sean, please. Oh, sorry, first, first speaker is Oliver, sorry. Welcome, Oliver. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah thank you. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, wait a moment. I just deal with my slide. Yeah, it's okay. So, uh, hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Oliver from. Really? <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me? Can you see me? <laughs> Oh, really? I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I just switched to another computer because some technical issue. Yeah. Sorry, just wait for a few minutes to solve the technical problems. Oh, Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm Uh, so everyone can see my slide. I think there are some echo problem, echoing. Okay, so still echo open. Ah, oh, I'm so sorry. I just turned off my microphone and yeah. So now, uh, now it's okay. Okay, I'm so sorry. Yeah. So everyone can see my slide. Yeah, just let me. Play. So, no, it's okay. Okay. Mm. I'm so sorry, just technical problem. So, still I spent a lot of time. So, wait a second. So, hello, everyone. I'm just Oliver. I'm from Office for Gender Equality in Taipei City. I'm very glad to share this topic for you from NGOs to government agencies alternative ways for promoting gender equality. So I just try to divide my presentation into three parts. I'm going to share the experience for observation, thinking and practice for you. So first, uh, for me, I just want to ask, what's the rule of government? Because for uh, before, I just think the government just as the enemy uh, of Oppositions, different positions. But now I just transfer to overseeing negotiation and collaboration. Why I change a lot? Uh, because first I, I wanna I wanna show why I treat government as an enemy before, because there was an important case in 2004 in Taiwan. Uh, a, a house party with 93 gay men was caught by police. This is a very important case in Taiwan. Uh, I show you some news title. Uh, everyone can see the right right way. It's all on the news or newspapers. 
picture. A house party with 93 gay men was caught by police. The title of news, you can see the upper one. It means uh, 39 men have good sex. Uh, one of them is HIV positive. The middle one, gay sex party, 28 gay men would infect with HIV. The down one, they said, uh, doing drug and group sex, 90 gay men party is very horny and dirty. So a similar photo and video appears in the media. Uh, in that period, it was Taiwan's Lunar New Year. Uh, in that time, a lot of people just go back to their hometown where you're having reunion dinner with your family. All the, uh, and the, on the TV, it's all 20, uh, 24 hours playing on TV or newspaper. It's all about prejudice, discrimination, and the stigma for LGBTQ and the HIV, HIV AIDS community. However, when I saw this photo and the video on news, newspaper, I just wonder why how many new 28 gay men were infected with HIV. Moreover, some media exposed their personal information after this. Some of the 39 gay men committed suicide. It's very sad. As a gay man, I feel very angry. Why government didn't do something to media and they try to keep the privacy for HIV positive? But what happened? I, I, uh, even for myself, I, I, I still feel very strange. I have turned my point from government is the enemy to collaborate partner. It's, uh, I think it's related to my work experience. Uh, the key point is uh, that uh, this is my work experience. The key point is uh, that being a HIV case manager in health department, having chance to know their situation and to try to do something there. Next, I have concluded to turn, turning point. I want to share with you. First turning point is observation from work precision, uh, positions. We have different backgrounds, social welfare and the pop, pop, uh, public health. From a discipline people-centered to disease-focused, that's why we treat issues are so different. The second turning point is experience from collaboration. Although government's officials and the staffs have authority, power, resource to firm, uh, firm, formulate a policy. However, still same as the public, they still just like the public, like you and me, having gender stereotype, prejudice and the discrimination. Here is my experience when I was working in uh, health department before. Um, it's very interesting because there was a manager. Once uh, she just called call me today and then she, she just talked to me. Hey, Oliver, I want to share this with you. You know, you know what? Gay men all like to stay at a dark place like public toilet and park. Sometimes they love to do drug there. Maybe we can create one place where it's very dark, dark for them. Then we can call addiction prevention centers worker or police to help them or to call them. So when I hear it, just give, a, give her a big, big smile and say, oh, come on, it's not true at all. There was a social context with gay men and public, public place. Then I ended the conversation. Actually, I didn't. I didn't say anything to her. I, I think I'm a kind, per, kind person. Yeah. So uh, I know. Of course, I know all those words were based on stereotype and the prejudice. But I want to know, except for blame the manager, what else can I do? How to eliminate stereotype and prejudice? especially on those people who has authority, power, and resource. So I try to discuss, uh, uh, dis distinguish their situations such as, there are three different kinds of group, not understanding upsing with gender equality, none of my business, some people just think about that, and not knowing how to do. 
then I may use different ways to deal with it. Here are some tips for me before I try to do something. Uh, first one, build up empathy. It takes time to explore, understand, recognize gender identity and gender LGBT sens uh, sensitivity. For me, when I commute, communicate with official workers, it is a chance to make things different and to change their mind slowly. Like gender identity, it takes time to understand what LGBTQ community looks like, regardless for oneself, families, friends, or ecology from workplace. As gender LGBTQ sensitivity, it took me six years in college and graduated school to have gender awareness. So it's, it's very difficult for government officials to have gender awareness only after taking a couple of courses, so lessons. It's unlikely that these government officials are required to put the idea of gender equality into their service. It's a little bit hard. So for next, uh, this chapter, I'm going to share about practice. We have formal and the informal initiatives to promote gender equality. First, I, want, I would like to introduce formal in, initiatives, a quick review, just like four, four kind of four initiatives, meeting and follow-ups, law and policies, gender-friendly officials, and task for you need. First meeting and follow up, we have a committee on gender equality of Taipei. This is the one kind of meeting and the LGBT community affairs co coordinations meeting. This is the second one. These two meetings are composed of experts, scholars, NGOs and chief of department uh, and hosted by mayor or vice mayor in Taipei city. In this meeting, you can draft proposal and uh, follow-ups on issue. We have a lot of LGBTQ policy we, uh, which, is com uh, which come from here. For example, we have Taipei City Workplace Gender Equality Index 7 plus 1. To promote gender equality on workplace, you can know more about this policy on tomorrow's, tomorrow's panel. We have another panel we, uh, we will just explain all about this uh, woman and workplace labor. Yeah. And uh, design courses for gender sensitivity on hate crime. It, it, uh, it's all the outcomes all by public private collaborations. Yeah. Second formal initiatives is laws and the policies. Uh, this uh, these are made by the gender, uh, you can see the uh, left one. It's made by the Gender Equality Committee, it's central government. Each local, local government has to, to follow it. For instance, gender mainstreaming policy is for integrating gender equality into actual plan, proposal, and policy by tools, six tools, which are gender statistics, gender analysis, gender uh, mechanism, gender awareness, training, gender budget, and the last one is gender impact assessment. About six tools uh, can know more detail on website, on gender equality commit website. Later, I will show the link into the chat box. In Taipei city government, we have our own version on gender mainstreaming policy. One of my duty is to help official workers to practice these six tools. So here are two of the outcomes from gender mainstreaming policy. We published a manual on last year called Taipei, Taipei 20, 20 plus, the map of the city of gender diversity and inclusion. You can see just like, this, I show the manual. Can you see this? Yeah, I think it's very beautiful. So we show we show a lot of different kinds of outcomes, all come from gender men. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very beautiful. Yeah. So 
This is all the outcomes comes from gender mainstreaming policy. If you want to uh, download to know more about this detail later, I will send the link to, into the uh, chat box too. Uh, next is gender friendly officials. It, 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 it is an important formal initiative to promote gender equality, just like the left one, uh, it's our uh, Vice Mayor Wang Huang and the Vice Mayor Tsai participated in two, 2020 Taiwan LGBT Pride. The next one, uh, the right one, uh, is all the council. Councilor advanced, they just uh, formulate just uh, advancing gender equality network of Taipei City Council. So the fourth is task force unit. It's my office, gender, uh, Office for Gender Equality of Taipei City Government. I'm going to share this with the next chapter, informal initiatives. Yeah. The practice too, it means for official work, uh, we have three different kinds of informal initiatives. Uh, for official workers, they treat my office as a supervisor to monitor what they do, good or bad. I think it's not exactly. I pose myself to be the bridge to offer more informal initiatives like emotion, emotional support, brainstorming, and uh, interpersonal relations, relations and the connections. First, I want to introduce emotional support. They need partner, especially when they don't have any support from college or supervisor, or don't know where has support. Uh, feeling exhausted by workload or protects from anti-LGBT groups, it's a lot of stress just come to them. Even if they could overcome these three situations, they still need feedbacks. So uh, we can try to imagine when someone doesn't have any support, feedback, would you treat gender equality as an important issue? Um, for what I observed, the answer definitely is no, it's not. Second, brainstorming. And third, in interpersonal relations, and the connections are necessary, helping them to think and uh, coming up with ideas by our professions. So it is important for government officials and the staff to learn uh, concept of gender equality by means of training courses, like this is tool of the gender mainstreaming policy. However, as I observed, it is more significant to use ways of informal initiatives and showing empathy to my work, working partners and uh, standing behind them. It's very important. So in sum, I just try to do is uh, listen to them, help them and to connect with them. It's very important. And uh, I think it's an alternative way to, uh, to have, uh, to have a look, uh, to collaborate with the official workers and the staffs. So last, I want to uh, just reflection, uh, just, I want to use this metaphor, a gender friendly workers in government, just like a cog in, a, in the machine. When we take a alternative ways to promoting gender equality, building connection and trust with them, share the same vision and collaborating with them, I believe one day that we may break up the whole structure, I think. So we know a gender-friendly workers in government is not easy to be found or hard to be trained. But just like I remind myself constantly, uh, it is an ongoing process. We will keep doing this. So, uh, so that's one, this is my uh, our office is contact information. If you want to uh, know more information about Taiwan and Taipei City's government about the gender equality, uh, you can just you can go go on it. So last thing, I just want to say something: just support freedom, support democracy, and support human rights. Never give up. Thank you for listening. Thank you.
Okay, thank you for、uh, Oliver's sharing about how he worked in government and what he observed and what he experiences.、Um, it's really hard for for the staff in government to、um, work with other、uh, working partners to promote gender equality or LGBTQ rights.、Um, so. Um, we hear some very special experiences from Oliver. And next,、um, I want to give the time to Sean. Are you ready, Sean? Are you here? Welcome, Sean.、Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Without echo, right? No. <laughs> Okay, we are really sorry that because、uh, all、uh, all the presenters in Taiwan we just sit next to each other, so our computers are really close to each other. Yeah, hopefully now it works. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So let me share my slide. Okay.、Uh, can you see my slide? Yeah. Okay.、Uh, so hi everyone.、Uh, my name is Shang Sichengdu, and I'm the director of policy advocacy in Taiwan Tongzhi Hanlai Association. Um, today, my topic is、uh, a changing relationship in two decades between LGBTQ organizations and the government authorities in Taiwan.、Um, And it highlights our organization's experiences. Okay, yeah. So first, let me introduce my organization. So Hanlai was the first、uh, LGBTQ national organization uh, uh, in Taiwan, and Hanlai was founded in 1998. At first, we we call ourselves telephone.、Uh, we call ourselves LGBTQ Hanlai. Uh, so you can you know that actually at first we just provide a、uh, um, telephone consultation services, but later we found out that there are more needs、uh, need to be、uh, like to be、um, done to、uh, to change the situation of Taiwan's LGBTQ community. So that we just expand our work into four different parts. The first part is the direct services to、uh, LGBT communities and their family members, especially parents. And the second part is about social education. So we provide a lot of social education in schools and like to general public and also to some、uh, professionals like the the healthcare providers, the social、um, workers and counselors because those are people who. Those are like professionals who might have、uh, LGBT clients, and recently we also focus on the area of workplace, because before we put a lot of effort um, um, at home on campus, but we just find out that many LGBT people, when they graduate, when they go into the workplace, they just become、uh, going back to the closet again. So that's why now we are trying to do、uh, more in the workplace. Okay, and the third part is about the advocacy work. So we before we just work、uh, together with many、uh, human rights.、Um, sorry, not before. Still now, <laughs> we work together with many LGBTQ organizations, gender organizations, and also like human rights organizations to do advocacy on LGBT related、um, human rights policies and regulations.、Um, like the biggest example is about the marriage equality. Okay, so we are also one of the、uh, group fights hardly for、uh, marriage equality in Taiwan, yeah. and.、Um, The fourth part is about international participation and networking. So we try hard to network with、uh, like LGBT groups and gender groups in、um, all around the world, especially in Asian countries. Okay,、uh, you can see in the left photo. These are my colleagues. So now we have twelve full time staffs and with four, more than four hundred volunteers. So we really rely on our.、Um, Our work really rely rely on uh, 
uh, our volunteers to um, do work together. Okay, so today I want to share about uh, how um, how we see like the changing relationship um, between uh, LGBT organizations and the government authorities in Taiwan. But we all know that because governments are there, are, like central governments um, and local government, there are a lot of government. So um, what I can share today is only like our relationship with Taipei city government. Yeah, so um, let me give you some background at first. Okay. So actually this is a photo of um, a very famous uh, park called the 22A Memorial Park. And uh, this is a park um, in the downtown uh, Taipei city. And uh, it, it's also a very famous park for uh, gay men. So, um, and actually LGBT movements uh, just um, grew up in 1990s in Taiwan. And uh, in early days, LGBTQ plus individuals have had intense relationship with police force. Um, police force raid uh, gay venues and sometimes force LGBTQ plus individuals to be exposed. And also in 1996, a promise made by the then Taipei mayor Chen Shui-bian to organize a large scale LGBTQ plus event was not fulfilled because he promised to a uh, many LGBT group at the time, but um, it, not, it, it was not fulfilled. So as a result, many uh, LGBT groups and activists are very pissed. And also <laughs> there was lack of mutual trust between LGBTQ plus groups and the Taipei city government at that time. Um, okay, so the next mayor, Mang Zhou, hired a progressive person, Lin Zhengshou, to be the director of civil affairs. And Director Lin promised to give budget to LGBTQ plus organizations to hold a big uh, event. To, and I think it's just to show their progressiveness compared to the previous mayor. And the event was named at the Taipei LGBT Festival, LGBTQ plus civil movements. You can see um, at the front, at the left uh, photo. It's the first. Uh, it's the photo of the first uh, event. The 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 event included big events like fair, forums, and education materials. It was the starting point for LGBTQ plus organizations to collaborate with Taipei. Department of Civil Affairs. And since then, the, the event just started, just um, are held like every year. For LGBTQ plus organizations, we earned the opportunity to practice organizing large scale events. Like in 2003, we held the first uh, LGBT Pride under the budget of the Taipei LGBT Festival. It also gives, gives a chance for LGBT groups to initiate communication with authorities that are more difficult to reach, such as the police force I mentioned before. And through the Taipei city government, we have the chance to have like some like trainings or discussion forums with the uh, police force. We also comply the, the, the learning about LGBTQ booklets, which is the left right uh, photo on the screen. And we just compiled uh, the booklets to teach the concepts of LGBTQ plus and their social situation to the general public. With the name of Taipei city government, 7,000 booklets spread to schools and public authorities every year, even to places in other countries, uh, sorry, other counties and cities. We've also encountered, of course, we've also encountered um, challenges during collaboration, such as um, if frontline staff members are um, like equipped with gender awareness. For an instance, in the past couple of years, posters, posters with images of real people were not allowed for the, for the LGBT festival because um, um, the staff from the government, they are afraid of that so the general public was not able to accept it. 
I remember is uh, like the seven, uh, the sixth or seventh, seventh events. With now, uh, uh, we have a real people, real people image, real uh, LGBT people on the posters. Okay, so I think it was a process of mutual uh, adaptation and communication between LGBT plus organizations and the city governments. There were also pressures imposed by anti-LGBTQ city council representative whose supporters were Christian and Catholic religious groups. Okay, this is uh, uh, the first uh, LGBT pride in Taiwan in 2003. As I mentioned at the time, it's under the budget of the Taipei, um, of the Taipei LGBT festival. But uh, as I also mentioned, actually it's got a lot of pressure uh, from the anti-LGBTQ um, city councilor. So, and it's, oh, yeah, and they also criticized um, that the Taipei city government shouldn't give a budget to organize this kind of pride. So for the next year in 2004, actually um, like Hotline and other LGBT groups, we just decided to held our um, own um, pride. So since 2004, the pride um, in Taiwan was all like self-funded without uh, Taipei city government's funding. And there comes another big um, like incident happened in 2010. So in 2010, the Department of Education of Taipei city issued an offer letter to all high schools and vocational schools in Taipei City. In the latter, school officials were asked to enhance their understanding and supervision of student club activities in order to prevent students from being seduced to engage in, in, in appropriate homosexual behaviors under the disguise of extracurricular activities and to protect the proper and healthy development of students. Actually, this letter comes from like a um, discussion under the Taipei City Council uh, because it's raised by some like anti-LGBTQ city councilors. However, it didn't become like a decision or a, a final agreement, but um, the um, Department of Education, they just decided to um, like issue this official letter to schools. So LGBTQ plus organizations started a petition and a big protest in front of the Taipei City Hall. Just um, uh, you can see in the picture. So in the protest demonstration, the director of Department of Education apologized for the letter and stated, and stated that a new official letter was already issued to junior high schools, high schools and vocational schools. The department did not mean to discriminate against LGBTQ and the department will improve their work on gender equity education in the future. Uh, we must say that actually um, at this time you already see that, oh, okay, gender equity education, oh, sorry, let me put some like background because in Taiwan we, um, we passed the law of gender equity education act since 2004. So actually I think Taiwan is the first uh, country in Asia or, or maybe like the first few countries in the world that have this gender equity education act. And we also have like this education in schools. So it gives a, um, a chance for students to learn about gender concepts and gender concept is a broad is a broad idea. So it includes about like um, um, relationship education and sex education, also about LGBT and gender diversity issues. So since two thousand four, uh, it gives um, um, the students a chance to learn about like the uh, gender diversity and LGBT concept. And but the um, uh, Anti-LGBTQ city councilors and also some like uh, anti-groups, they also protest for this. And so I think that's why this uh, letter uh, happened. And um, since then, after this um, like uh, protest, um, the Taipei city government, the staff of, from the Taipei city government, 
they just have a discussion with the uh, LGBTQ organ and gender organizations. And so the projects of uh, LGBT community affairs coordination meeting was given birth. So based on the project, uh, LGBTQ plus uh, organizations have the opportunities to attend regular meetings with various departments of the city government. And we can like supervise policies, provide suggestions, suggestions, and to learn about the work and limitation of public authorities. Um, I really say that because I uh, uh, joined Hotline uh, in 2002 as a volunteer, and I remember that uh, during the like 2000s, actually we just uh, go on the, we went on the street for to protest a lot, quite a lot, because at that at that time we really hard to find a chance to like negotiate with the government, like. And uh, now with this new project, actually we could sit down and discuss LGBTQ plus related policies with the city government. But also we, we, we also must say that it's just uh, like a, also like a very long process because at first, like um, we, um, okay, the project acts um, like all the public authorities, all the departments in Taipei city government, they need to like to share what they have done, their work about LGBT issues um, to uh, like LGBT organizations, but what they show is about like uh, they they just put all uh, like activities activities related to like um, um, gender, but not to LGBT. So we need to look at all this long list and say that oh this is not about related to LGBT. This is not related to LGBT. Yeah. So like back and forth, back and forth. Now, I think the meeting just become like a more um, like concentrated also. And also there's another important thing is that um, representatives of LGBTQ plus organizations started to be invited to join the committee of women's rights promotion since 2009. The, uh, this committee now is called the gender equality committee. And this committee is uh, really important because uh, we can discuss like uh, about uh, uh, like gender related uh, policies with more power. And after the setup for the Taipei City Office for Gender Equality, which Oliver was worked for, um, this um, office um, was um, established in 2014. LGBTQ plus uh, committee members in uh, the committee could use the tools of performance evaluation to suggest city departments engage in more services related to gender diversity to improve their evaluation results. However, I must say that along with the growth of LGBTQ plus uh, movements, the anti-LGBTQ plus power also become more organized strategically Many of them joined and became the representatives of parents' teacher associations and applied to join the Gender Equity Education Committee. So, and the government has since used the committees as a buffer zone to deal with the social conflicts. As a result, LGBTQ plus uh, groups and anti-LGBTQ plus groups encounter each other in the committee, especially in the gender equity education. Okay. Okay, so I still have three minutes, so I have to do faster. Okay, so many important and progressive uh, policies and issues has been raised in the coordination meetings and gender related committees, such as like census couple registration and welfare for employees of Taipei city government. These policies um, were even earlier than census marriage was legalized in Taiwan. And after census marriage was legalized uh, in 2019 in Taiwan, LGBTQ organizations take this as a chance to negotiate with the city governments that it's a good timing to do city marketing. We visited Amsterdam Pride in 2018 and just take uh, Amsterdam Pride as a good example. As a result, more departments in the city government joined to promote Taiwan LGBT Pride in 2019. 
which makes the promotion bigger than ever. You could see the pride promotion material on the street very easily, just as shown in the um, photos. Also, uh, we have more LGBTQ friendly um, like uh, candidates being elected in the uh, city council. So uh, now there's an alliance called the Taipei City Council's Alliance to promote gender equality, which is also our good um, like alliance. And with the help of LGBTQ plus friendly city councilors, the city government also set up a rainbow landmark in the pop popular area, which soon became a huge hot spot for taking photos. The city government also do more promotion and set up more rainbow landmarks to promote rainbow economy afterwards. Also, there are more LGBTQ plus related trainings and lectures to civil servants, and not only to the staff, but also to management positions. And in my experiences, many civil servants are still not familiar with LGBT and their families. So it's really a good chance uh, for us to uh, negotiate with them, to teach them about LGBT issues and to let them to like, uh, when they provide services or when they think about policies, they can think about LGBT. And some advances are made in the committees and the coordination meetings also, such as putting LGBTQ plus issues in the Taipei City Workplace Gender Equality Index. Also the Department of Policy, uh, sorry, the, the Department of Police also designed courses for gender sensitivity on hate crime. The but Center Sean, for Seniors, the Center for left. Teenagers and the Center for of uh, Family Education all start to work with LGBTQ plus uh, organizations for lectures and events. And we also have a chance to look through um, like all the promotion materials of Taipei city government to see that if uh, these promotions um, materials for citizens are LGBT inclusive. Um, so for 20 years, LGBTQ plus organizations and the Taipei city government have improved our relationship from having no mutual trust to supervising city policies and now to more collaborations. And I must say that uh, it's, it's, it is thanks to political opportunities so that LGBTQ plus organizations are given more chances to make changes, changes within the system. However, there are still challenges. Gender equity education still remain a critical and controversial issue and gender awareness of authority leaders play an important role in whether gender equality policies can be truly implemented. And also LGBTQ plus related issues seem to be, have gained some importance uh, in the uh, Taipei city government. But uh, we, I think it could be done more to, to become like a more like a key policies. Okay, so uh, this is my presentation and thank you for your listening and I look forward for your questions and feedbacks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sean. And uh, so we have the uh, views from the government and the views from uh, advocacy groups. So next, these these experiences are from Taiwan. So next, we will uh to we will listen to the experience from um Denmark, the European. Um. So next, welcome, Aaron. Thank the you. Floor, so much. Yeah. Can everybody see the screen? Yes. Sure. Perfect. I tried to put a picture on there just while uh, while you were talking because, of course. Uh, as, as most of you know, I've been in Taipei, uh, so I've seen this amazing cross uh, crossroad um, uh, with the, the rainbow. Um, let me start with introducing myself. Um, so I'm indeed Aaron Lefebvre, uh, and at this stage, I am the director of human rights for Copenhagen 2021. Um, and our organization is currently executing World Pride and Euro games in Copenhagen, Denmark, and also Malmö uh, in Sweden. Um, maybe a little bit of a background uh, um, on Copenhagen 2021 itself. Um, World Pride and Euro Games are two mega events, as some of you might know, 
um, that are bringing together people from our communities and allies um, on the one hand to protest uh, and show that we exist, uh, on the other hand also to build bonds uh, um, and to have an opportunity to be together. May that be in a conference, may that be uh, in concerts or a party or uh, in this sense, Euro games in sports. Um, Copenhagen 2021 um, uh, chose to uh, heavily invest in the human rights aspect of uh, World Pride. Um, and as previous, um, previous World Prides have also done, there will be a human rights conference, but we chose to go further than just a two-day two conference and uh, have a full team in place that is executing the Human Rights Forum. And this forum exists out of different aspects in which we also really try to um, motivate and engage uh, our own government, but also governments um, and, and um, elected officials from all over the world to work with us towards the inclusion of the LGBTI community. And we feel that this is an obligation uh, for a world event like Copenhagen 2021, because of course we, we spent a lot of money and if we don't do that in the right way, if we don't have sustainability and an impact on, um, uh, on and for our community that money could have used in different ways, as for instance, directly in um, countries in for instance, the global South um, being used as development money. Um, I will talk a little bit about uh, the engagement of, in this sense, it's Copenhagen 2021, working with governments, but also against certain governments uh, when it comes to their policies. Now, when it comes to the engagements in general, um, we are, of course, uh, um, working with the governments of Denmark and Sweden. And I also think it is very fair to say that the governments of Denmark and Sweden are um, rather supportive governments that are uh, very interested in making sure that this LGBTI inclusive message is sent out to the world. We have to be very clear, huh? um, although our governments are very supportive, there is also still a lot of work to do in our own countries. And I think we also want to make sure that that is really visible during the events we're organizing, not just um, uh, making visible what is happening in the rest of the world, but also motivating the governments that are more advanced in LGBTI inclusion to keep on doing more. Um, just as, uh, as some examples, for instance, our intersex community um, is, is still uh, at a very big disadvantage in every country in the world, but also in our own countries. And that is also where we try to motivate our own governments uh, to do a lot. But of course, we're also working together with other governments from all over the world. Um, some of them, it is, of course, almost impossible to work with, um, but the ones that are supportive, um, and most of these governments are either part of the Equal Rights Coalition or um, the LGBTI core group of the United Nations, and those governments are really included in the programs we're executing and uh, the whole preparation towards Copenhagen 2021. Just to name a couple of governments that are really out there, and really supportive, uh, we're talking about, um, uh, of course, uh, at this stage, the United States uh, with the Biden administration in Canada, in South America, a lot of engagement from Chile, Uruguay, uh, also Mexico and Argentina, uh, in Europe, uh, mainly the, the Northwestern and the Western um, governments, but also serious, uh, a serious mention to North Macedonia. Although in the Western Balkans, not always the easiest government uh, and the easiest region to work with, still a government that is willing to show some leadership in the region. Uh, in Africa, of course, that is South Africa. In Asia, um, next to Nepal, who recently became a member of the LGBTI core group, we do also have quite some engagement with, um, with Taiwan. Uh, and when we look at Oceania, of course, New Zealand and Australia are extremely supportive. But of course, uh, we also have to work with governments that are not supportive, or at least work um, with the community in these countries to make sure that their governments do understand that what they're doing is not right. Now, I will give a little bit more of an outline about that later using a European example, which is Poland, to give a little bit uh, of a background how our governments and our organization is working in order to make the situation in Poland visible. 
Um, but next to governments, we're also closely working together with parliamentarians, so with legislators, not only on the national level, but also on the regional and local level. Uh, parliamentarians are, of course, those in charge of making legislation. And for us, it's really important to also make their cause visible and to make sure that they can make connections amongst each other because parliamentarians are the ones that in the end can influence the legislative process. And that can be done in different ways. Of course, the individual parliamentarians are, um, uh, are important and, and we speak to them, but we also wanna make sure they connect with each other, connect with other political groups. And that is for instance possible through cross uh, party caucuses, but also um, uh, organizations or uh, structures like, for instance, the LGBTI intergroup of the European Parliament or an organization like uh, the Global Equality Caucus, Parliamentarians for Global Action, uh, the European Parliamentary Forum for Sexual and Reproductive Health Rights. Those organizations bring together parliamentarians, um, uh, have discussions around the topic of LGBTI inclusion, for them to, on the one hand, broaden their network, uh, but also um, for them to learn from other parliamentarians on the work they are doing. And it's really important to not only look at a national level, but also look at a cross-border level. Some parliamentarians in some countries are um, uh, rather alone when it comes to LGBTI inclusion. Then the understanding that there is like-minded parliamentarians in other parts of the world and having a direct connection with them is something that really inspires and also gives them an opportunity to move forward um, using their network to uh, understand what good steps to take would be. Now, as, as Copenhagen 2021, we're also heavily working together with our foreign missions. And with that, I mean the Danish embassies and the Swedish embassies abroad, because we also want to make sure that, um, especially during the time of a pandemic as we are in now, the message of Copenhagen 2021 and the voice of community members that will not be able to travel to Copenhagen or Malmö is being heard, their faces are seen and their story can get out there. And I think when we are looking at uh, the situation we are in now, in which it is less likely that people from all over the world will be able to travel, um, we actually got the opportunity to um, rethink our strategy and involve these foreign missions, missions, these Danish and Swedish uh, embassies abroad to set up events, round tables, film screenings, cultural events, pride events in their own host country. And the good thing there is that of course that the embassies working together and that is what you see um, on the bottom always in conversation with local and national activists um, are closer to, um, uh, uh, to the center of uh, where everything is happening when it comes to LGBTI inclusion in their own country, have often offices in all these different countries and are really good at assessing what is possible and what is not possible when it comes to giving activists a face and a voice in their own country. And you can imagine that there's countries where there's a lot of possibilities, uh, of course, uh, Europe, South America, in um, in, uh, in different countries. There's also some countries in Asia where the situation is easier, but there's also embassies located in countries that are extremely difficult, talking about Sudan, Saudi Arabia, Iran. And of course, we are very careful with um, doing anything in countries where it can only work against our community. And in some countries, it is even an issue for community members to visit the embassy because the simple fact that they're seen at an embassy means for uh, their national security service that um, they, uh, they might be uh, spying on behalf of this embassy or they might be giving information they should not give. So again, we're very careful that foreign missions are one of these four um, elements of engagement we really have with, um, uh, with uh, public uh, offices within our own countries. And then of course, and I think um, also in Europe, a very important element is the international organizations. Apart from the United Nations, uh, of course, uh, the world uh, organization dealing with, uh, with human rights. Uh, we are also part of the European Union, the Council of Europe and the Nordic Council. And through uh, the European Union, there is a lot of opportunity to voice displeasure, to voice discontent, when it comes to 
um, what is exactly happening in other countries of the European Union or in other parts of the world, acting as a block against a situation in, for instance, the global south. But as you will see at the second part of my presentation, when we really focus on the situation in Poland, the European Union has also um, been one of the platforms where our governments really had the opportunity to voice their displeasure, not only through um, uh, the direct government engagement of, for instance, Denmark, but also the European Parliament and the European Commission. I do have to be very honest that the European Union is not always the most effective platform or international organization to use. And often also, as we say, toothless when it comes to real action, it is an opportunity for the countries within the European Union and citizens from other countries to show their displeasure and voice their concern when it comes to the situation in, for instance, Hungary, Poland, uh, but up to a certain extent, also other European Union countries, making sure that our community members there do not feel alone. They feel that they're seen, they feel that they're heard, and they understand that it's not a fight of only the community members in the country itself, but we take this up as a fight of a community and their allies um, in the other countries of the European Union as well. Now, the Nordic Council, just as a small outline here, is a collaboration of the different Nordic countries, Finland, Iceland, uh, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, um, that are um, rather similar when it comes to their makeup um, and, and their history. And also there, you see, it's important for these five countries to work together on LGBTI inclusion, not only in their own um, area, but also very much acting as a block when communicating about diversity and inclusion and the importance uh, when, we are, um, uh, when we are engaging with other countries. Again, and, and I keep on um, mentioning this, whatever we are doing, we are always doing this in conversation with local and national activists um, uh, that are part of our community because we have to be really careful moving into a country very enthusiastically saying, we are gonna do whatever we can to make the LGBTI community visible. Um, I worked with, uh, with our Dutch uh, embassy in Kazakhstan. I worked with the European delegation in Guyana and in, in Costa Rica, and especially in the first two countries, it is often contraproductive to be too actively present and push this LGBTI uh, agenda um, uh, publicly instead of silent uh, or silent diplomacy, uh, creating spaces for community members without too much outside engagement and visibility. And it's really important to make sure that whenever you do something in a country or with a country, you listen to the activists that are in this country themselves, because they're often the ones that know best what works and what does not work out of experience. And whenever we engage in um, other countries, um, we are very much aware of this. Now, what I want to show you, and we are working uh, from Copenhagen 2021 side, we are working closely with our community in Poland through all these different um, uh, elements uh, that I mentioned before. So governments, parliamentarians, for missions, in order to make sure that their, um, that their case is visible, heard, um, and that, uh, that they feel that they're supported by the community. Now, I don't know if anybody or everybody on this, um, uh, on this call has any clue what is actually happening in Poland. So what I wanna do is show you a three minute video on the situation in Poland. So you know what, um, what currently is happening in Poland when it comes to the LGBTI community, which to some of you might be quite surprising knowing that Poland is a central European country bordering Germany. Um, um, so for, for most people that are not living in Europe, it is, it is a surprise um, what the situation there is. Shall I just click here? Uh, would that work? Yes. I think it should work, no? Yeah, just click the link. Yeah. See, it's being supported uh, uh, by not uh, only the Catholic... Uh, can't see the th the video. Ah, uh, you can't see the video. Okay, wait. So I will have to uh, give share you your desk. Yes, I will share my desk. Uh, desktop one. It should work now. Correct. Yes. Okay. 
The LGBTQ community in Poland has a message for the world. We don't feel safe here. This comes after a newspaper distributed LGBT free zone stickers. People were attacked in an equality march and a government minister defended the Archbishop of Krakow who called the community a rainbow plague. We asked the team at Euronews to explain what's going down in Poland. Marching for equality, these people in Bialystok in Poland were attacked. This was the first ever Pride March in that city. The people there attacked by counter demonstrators, the police detaining a number of far right activists. Earlier last month, we saw these distributed. They might look like normal stickers, but these are anti LGBT, LGBT free zone stickers, in fact, that this newspaper in Poland printed so users could display them. And then most recently, we've seen comments from a Polish archbishop in Krakow describing what he calls a rainbow plague descending on Poland to conquer people's souls. Those comments defended by the government minister for humanitarian aid. This is Poland in 2019. People there from the LGBT community, well, they're scared. And speaking to us here in the Cube, that's our social media news desk right here in the heart of Euronews, they have been saying to us that this is a scary time. Many of them don't want to show their faces and identify on television in case people uh, find out who they are and they might fear they will be targeted. But one of those who did speak to us is Marek. He is one of the only uh, openly gay politicians in the country. Well, this is what he said to us when we spoke to him. Well, I'm one of the few openly gay politicians uh, in Poland. We have lost the feeling that we are that we are equal, that we are protected by the state. And even though in theory we are in the middle of Europe, in a European country in the EU, we have lost, we have lost this support, we have lost this very basic infrastructure that every human being should have in a democratic state. And this here, this is Magda. She's a very prominent LGBT activist in Poland on Instagram here, leading demonstrations against those comments by the Archbishop, which many people see as being supported by not only the Catholic Church in the country, but many prominent politicians, even up to the government level. Well, Magda, she shared her thoughts with us that fear we could hear in her voice as well, but she does have some hope for the future. This is what she said to us. We don't feel safe. To be honest, for me, for example, it was always obvious that uh, I have some kind of rainbow, uh, you know, the, the things on me, like a bag or like a pins. Uh, and now I'm thinking if it's safe to wear something like this. But I always trying, uh, I always looking for uh, good sides when are, uh, when it comes to, to what is happening now. And I think that... Uh, the big outrage. Uh, I hope that uh, it's like the, the moment of change really important for our country. Yes, let me go back. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out. Yes, let me go back to the, yes. Um, so what do you see Aaron, now? Sorry, yes? Aaron, you have two minutes left. Ah, two just minutes. two minutes, okay. Okay, thank you. Very quick, no problem. So what you see happening in Poland is um, a deteriora deterioration of the situation because of a very homophobic government. Um, the problem is that it's, it's almost impossible at this stage to engage with the, pro the, the government of Poland. The government of Poland is non-cooperative. They do not want to um, engage with anything that is uh, connected to LGBTI inclusion. Um, and of course, it is very important for those countries that can, especially because we're part of the same European Union, where everybody is supposed to be equal um, and treated without dis discrimination. It is very important from outside, or sorry, outside of Poland, within this European Union, I should say, to voice the discontent. And that should not only happen through um, activist engagement, but also through national governments of other countries. Um, and of course, we are motivating our Danish government to really move forward and push against what is happening in Poland, not only mentioning the LGBTI inclusion part, but also the fact that the European Union is built up out of uh, countries that are obeying equality and non-discrimination, because it is not only about the LGBTI community here, we're seeing that, of course, one group is targeted, but we can put this in a bigger perspective. 
if it happens towards the LGBTI community, there will also be the liberty taken to um, push um, for, for um, uh, actions against other minorities within our community. Um, I will not show you all the other videos. I can share the, uh, I can share the slides in that respect. Through the European Union, what we have been doing in, in the past couple of years, together with our partners at the um, LGBTI intergroup, which is the intergroup of European parliamentarians, is um, work towards a very strong message from the European Union. And I know many of the organizations within the European Union countries have been pushing for this and working towards this. So our national governments um, and, and the European Union have been coming forward telling Poland what you're doing is not right, what you're doing is, um, is, is very hurtful for the community in Poland, but it is also very bad for the European Union as such, looking from the perspective that we are supposed to be a union of equality and non-discrimination. Um, let me just round up here uh, so you can show the other videos later. I'm sorry, I didn't know it went this fast. Um, but in that sense, it is really important to engage the national governments. In our case, that is the government of Denmark and Sweden, bringing it up in the different meetings on European Union level. The national and European parliamentarians um, are uh, very fundamental here, and especially the European Parliament, especially driven by some of the European parliamentarians, part of the community themselves, have been really strong in voicing their discontent, also adopting a rainbow uh, sorry, uh, an LGBTI freedom zone, as you can see here on the screen, which is um, more of a, um, a resolution where they're very much speaking against the Polish government. It's not law, but it is to show that the European Union should be equal for all. And next to that, we're closely working together with our mission in Poland, making sure that there is the support from the embassies. Community members know that they're not standing alone. Governments are through the embassies listening to them and inviting these um, activists over. And with all these aspects, we try to move our own government and um, the, the international organizations Denmark is a part of to move against cases as you see now happening in Poland. And we have to be really careful because it's a little bit of a domino effect. We cannot be, um, uh, we, we cannot be lazy and think that we have all the rights in Denmark and Sweden. We have to be very much aware that rights are being rolled back faster than they come into place. We see this happening in Poland, we see this happening in Hungary, but we also see our own governments slowing down with the inclusion, um, uh, the inclusion cause. Um, so that is a little bit how we are working with, with the governments. And I wish I had more time because I had some other videos, but I understand it's, it's quite, uh, we're quite pressing in time. Um, so yeah, that is, that is a bit of the, the outlines of Copenhagen 2021 and, and our efforts in including governments uh, when it comes to LGBTI inclusion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. So uh, why, don't we just see any questions from the audience? I guess it's not, there's no, still no questions from audience. So if we have more time, uh, Aaron, you can uh, play the videos. Let me play the videos quickly, yes. It, it's just for you to, what I wanna show is, uh, oh wait, let me know. Try to open it again. What I want to show is the reaction of um, the European Parliament and, um, oh wait, now I have to share my whole screen. Eh? Give me a second, I'll do it quickly. Um, share screen. Uh, desk, okay, I guess I'm sharing it now. Oh. Uh, no, I have to, yeah, it's here. Um, second, yes. So I just want to show you the reaction of the European parliamentarians recently when adopting this European Union resolution to show you how important it is um, to engage other governments and parliamentarians. Not the European Union and LGBTIQ freedom zone. Not at all because we believe that this is a lived reality for many queers inside of the EU. 
but because we want to pledge that we will do everything in our power to make it a reality. We want this to be the starting point for a broader debate about what needs to be done for LGBTI rights in the EU and beyond. Be part of this debate and continue to wave your rainbow flags all across Europe. shall be a signal, a signal to the community everywhere in Europe. This battle is far from being over, this story is far from being told, and it will take all of us together. But then, yes, then we can do it. We can make the European Union an LGBTIQ freedom zone. So um, what, what you see in this video is um, uh, the parliamentarians from the European Union together with in the video, and you, you don't know the faces, I understand, but um, uh, government ministers from Belgium, from, uh, from Denmark, from Sweden, from Spain, from Italy, from different parts of the European Union, showing the importance for them of having this LGBTI inclusive zone. And of course, uh, we're not mentioning Poland here by name, we're not naming and blaming, but it's very clear for Poland that there is, for the Polish government, that there is a very strong opposition all over the European Union against the practice that they are um, executing right now, not only by activists, not only by community members, but also very much by the people that are in power in all these other countries. Um, and if I have, do I have two more minutes? Then I, um, then I will round up. I want, to, uh, I want to close with the last video. And the last video is a video of um, um, the president of the European Commission. The president of the European Commission is basically the president of the European Union. Just as a little bit of background information, the woman you will see right now, who is our president, is a mother of, I think, five to seven kids. She is a German um, Christian Democrat, so she's not from the most liberal party but she gave a statement in the European Parliament recently on behalf of the European government on, um, uh, on the importance of inclusion. Uh, let me know, okay. I will not rest when it comes to building a union of equality, a union where you can be who you are and love who you want without fear and recrimination. Because being yourself is not your ideology. It is your identity, and no one can ever take it away. So I want to be crystal clear. LGBTQI free zones are humanity free zones, and they have no place in our union. So with all these videos, what I want to show is that an action in one country, an action, uh, uh, for instance, happening in Poland, really needs a very strong uh, counterbalance from other countries. Poland is relying on the European Union. Poland is receiving billions of euros every year from other European Union states, which is taxpayers' money. It is important to engage governments, not only your own government, but governments in the region with the right examples and with a very strong voice of, um, uh, of discontent with the way LGBTI inclusion is being handled. And I know that the Asian perspective is very different from the European perspective, but with this presentation, I wanted to show you how we are working with governments, why we are working with governments and the effect it has um, when governments and when parliamentarians are very active in bringing out this message of inclusion 
not only for their own country, but also for other countries in the region and in the wider world. Thank you, Aaron. That's a um, very powerful statement from European Commission. And there's a question from our audience, Morgan Auger. And I have, I, uh, I, I can answer I, it. I, okay, I uh, first I, I have to um, repeat his, question, uh, his or her question first to the audience online. Okay. Uh, the question from Morgan Auger. Um, I am a French and Canadian trans rights advocate of operating from Canada via the Morgan Auger Foundation. The reaction to Poland's conduct within the EU has been disappointing. Is there really nothing that can be done which has teeth? So this question, I think it's for Aaron. Yes, um, it is a very good question, Morgan. And I also understand, and that is also what we feel, that um, uh, the reaction of the European Union has in some ways been really disappointing. Now, of course, uh, um, when you see uh, the voice of this content um, of the people I just showed, that does not mean that there's a direct action. The problem with the European Union is that most of these actions, if not all of these actions that can be taken, can only be taken with a, uh, with unanimity, which basically means that everybody, every single European Union member state has to agree on this. The problem there is as well that Poland is not by itself, but there's also countries like Hungary that are always backing what is happening in Poland. And for that reason, um, at this stage, it is really hard to really show teeth. But what I do have to mention and what I do have to say is that although it's going slow, you see more and more discontent from other countries in the European Union when it comes to their, uh, uh, to, to their policies. Again, it goes very slow, but what I read today is, for instance, that the Dutch uh, prime minister doesn't want to have voting, um, uh, voting with vetoes or with unanimity anymore, but they want to go to a system where a majority can, uh, can act against a minority, in this case, for instance, in Poland. Of course, so we're talking about a union with 27 countries. It will be extremely hard to really change this situation. But what I want to, um, what I really want to separate here is on the one hand, um, there is the message that gets out. And this message is being seen by activists all over the European Union, all over the world. And this message of support might not directly change the policy of the government of Poland. It does show our community in Poland, but also in other European Union countries, that their struggle is not unseen. Their struggle is being heard, their struggle is being seen, and there is support, financial support, there is backing, uh, the parliamentarians are traveling to Poland to be present at different pride marches. The second step will be the European Union starting to act. In the next couple of years, we do foresee the European Union being able to act through a mechanism where countries that are not obeying by the rule of uh, democracy and freedom can be punished by withholding money that they would normally get. Do I think it is perfect? Absolutely not. It's far from perfect. But in a union like we have, things are going very slowly. And maybe I want to end with saying one thing. You hear a lot of people scream, let's get rid of Poland out of the European Union. But let us be very clear. If we kick Poland out of the European Union, there will be no way we can have an influence on what is happening in Poland and support our community members. So although Poland is the biggest, uh, how do I say this in a nice way, the biggest um, uh, bully in the European Union as such, we need to make sure that through this cooperation within the European Union, we can have an influence, we can support our community members and we prevent them from slipping into a um, situation like Belarus, Russia, where we're looking at a Slavic approach of uh, you cannot exist, you cannot receive money for your cause. And I think looking at the two options, the European Union option, although far from perfect for now, is the best option to support our community members in Poland. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, 
So I have some questions for each speaker. Um, you can um, choose to answer. And the first, uh, just only one question first. Um, sometimes the LGBT issue could be used as political gain by some politicians or political parties. Do you think it is good or bad for LGBT activism in your country or your city? So, uh, who wants to answer first? Sean? Thank you. Um, okay, so I think, um, um, so for the good side that uh, we will have more public discussion and um, it's also a good chance that we can, like for LGBT activists, and LGBT groups, we can do social education. And the best side is that we will have more work. So it seems the best side, you have to spend a lot of time explaining um, why LGBT is a must to uh, promote uh, and why people have to know LGBT community, right? Okay, so um, about this question. Um, so Aaron, do you have something to tell us? <laughs> Could you repeat the question? Because I just missed the exact question. Okay. Um, I mean, sometimes um, LGBT issues could be used as political gain by some politicians or po political parties. They will uh, use you LGBT uh, just like um, governments do something good for LGBT community and they'll um, um, claim that, oh, it's our party's spirits. Yeah, so uh, to, buy, uh, to uh, gain more votes from people. I think- Especially, yeah, especially yeah. from com LGBT community. Yeah. but. Um, sometimes it's not really good for the community. Community, it's just some kind of interest for the politicians. And I think that our civil society organizations, the organizations um, uh, in in the country here in Denmark, but also all over the world, when you look at your politics, and we had elections in the Netherlands, where I'm originally from, recently we really need to hold the politicians accountable and civil society organizations should not fall into the trip, trap of a politician saying, oh, but we're very inclusive because look what we did two years ago uh, when it comes to the LGBTI community. Politicians can only say that they're inclusive towards our community if they constantly show their willingness to include us in decisions, make sure that the law and the policy is being advised advanced and also make sure and that is one thing that I find, find very important to mention also make sure that they're not just talking about one part of our community we are working together we are an LGBTI community we are not just the gay community not just the transgender community we have to be really careful of being um, uh, being divided by politicians that are saying yeah but we are working hard for the transgender community Gay is wrong, lesbian is wrong, but the transgender community is fine. We have to say, no, we are working together. We are an LGBTI community and everything we're doing should be to the advancement of the entire community. Don't put parts of our community against each other. Also, um, for instance, in the case where they say, oh, but we are totally fine with the LGBTI community as long as it's white Western LGBTI people, the Muslim ones we don't want. It doesn't work like that. We have to make sure we stand with the entire community and with other minorities 
And I think that is something to always be on guard for. Don't let us be used in a way that we are actually falling into a divide. Let us always guard that when politicians use the LGBTI community to gain votes, we scrutinize them, we are really clear on what the outlines are, and we are really telling them what they need to do in order to be able to say that they are actually working for our community. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Erin. And is there any questions from speakers or from, from the audience? Oliver, do you have any questions for Erin or Sean? Uh, I only have some few uh, feedback from Aaron because it's really surprised me because in my mind, I think just uh, European is very uh, gender friendly. You, you, you need for each country. So when I hear about, about the Poland, it's really surprised me. So yeah. So really thank you for your sharing. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I want to go back to answer the, uh, the host, uh, she, uh, she asked a, a question about the politi uh, po uh, politicians, the, the question. Yeah, because I, I think in, in positive way, in Taipei city government, uh, from positive way, we can just uh, hear about what the society, they, they want to care about the gender equality issue because in the process, a lot of people will say, oh, maybe we, we don't like LGBT people and we, we hope the gender, uh, gender equality education, you can do something more. So uh, when I hear about those questions, I will just put it into the uh, in, informal or formal um, initiatives to do something in actual plan and the policy, but from negative, uh, negative ways because sometimes when they you uh, try to use the uh, they will pr produce some uh, stereotype and uh, uh, prejudice or discrimination on LGBT group if they produce a like of all this we we, we must spend many years to deal with it so it's a negative way it's very hard yeah so that's my mind yeah Thank you. But still, thank you, Aaron. I learned a lot. It's yeah, a very interesting perspective, but I think it is important to understand that if we do not guard progress and if we let politicians get away with using our name and saying there's progress, we are really going to uh, wake up one day seeing our rights being taken away. And it's very important to every single day make sure that the governments and the politicians know that the fight is not over when, until everybody has the right to exist within our community. And we're not even at 5% of what we should um, have if we have full equality in the world. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, Oliver. Um, I'm so sorry that uh, the panel is over time. So we have to end here. And uh, I'm, I, I did learn a lot from Aaron and Sean and uh, Oliver. As a government staff, we have to try our best to do more um, good for the LGBT community. And uh, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all the audience um, to join us today, join the event. And thank you, especially thank you, Aaron. Uh, yes, uh, you, are, you are the only one here um, because we, 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 we have a very uh, uh, unfortunate situation before the event. We uh, lost mm -hmm. two speakers today but uh, very fortunately we did it we finished this panel and it's, it looks like a, a success and thank you all the audience um, we uh, end uh, the session here and if you miss any part of this session you can uh, replay the video uh, on the platform or you can replay uh, on our YouTube channel okay so 
I'm so sorry, four of us, can we just take a group photo? Oh. Yes. Yeah, it's very important. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look, Aaron, you are handsome. No. <laughs> Uh, uh, who can? Oh, uh, okay, Sean. Okay. Sean will do it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Goodbye.